Hey guys, it's Big Mike, and like always, I'd like to thank you for being here today. Today we've got John Hoagland from Top Step Trader. He's been trading for about 30 years. He's also a senior scout at Top Step, and he's done several webinars on BMT before, which I would highly recommend that you check out because they're all excellent and have got uh, really great uh, reviews and feedback. Um, Sorry, I had to clear my throat there. Uh, today, John is going to be talking about order flow and tape reading, or what he calls the new pit. And uh, John comes from the floor, so, you know, that's the old pit, and now everything is moved to screen trading, obviously. So uh, the new pit is uh, basically reading order flow uh, and uh, reading the tape. So today he wants to touch on uh, what the, the job of the market is, the importance of volume validation, uh, reading time and sales and the trade flow, uh, recognizing stop runs, iceberg orders, and etc. Developing a sense of other time frames that are in control of the market. And we're also going to open it up for questions at the end. So uh, John has asked that we try to hold all of the questions until the end of the presentation. So do me a favor and please do that. Uh, we will have plenty of time at the end of the presentation to try to get everyone's questions answered. Uh, as always, the webinar is being recorded, and I will post it on BMT in the usual spot sometime tomorrow. I will also send it over to uh, John at Top Step Trader, and uh, they can send out the information on their Twitter feed and post it on their YouTube channel um, once we get that done sometime tomorrow. All right, guys, as you have questions, just type them into the question box. Um, again, try to hold them until the end and then we'll start answering those after John's done with his presentation. All right, guys, give me one second, and I will be turning things over to John. All right, Big Mike, uh, thank you very much for that uh very nice uh, introduction. I appreciate it. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome, fellow students of the market. Uh, thank you very much for trusting me with your time. Uh, I should probably introduce myself first to those who, who don't know me. Hang on one second. I'm assuming we're showing the right screen. Okay, there I am. Uh, talking to you right now from the Board of Trade trading floor. I have a very long history in trading as far as my family's concerned. My dad was uh, on the Board of Trade floor for 40 years as the hedge manager at Ralston Purina, also as the head grain analyst for Chicago Grain, and his father before him traded crash, cash grains as far back as the Great Depression. I had my first trip to the trading floor at six years old. It's no wonder I got the bug early. Uh, but I did work my way up from runner to clerk, got hired by a prop company, funded my own account for quite a long time, and became a uh, trader as well as a floor broker for about 12 years. And I have almost 30 years in the futures industry. Um, now I am uh, currently trading a little bit and, and uh, scouting for trading talent at Top Step Trader as the senior trading scout. I'm trying to uh, get my uh, slides to move here. Okay, uh, Top Step Trader is a global trading talent scouting agencies seeking, developing, and backing talented traders from around the world. Screen traders, uh, pit traders, trying to make the transition to screen trading as I am and have been doing. Uh, what this does, it gives us a great venue to learn from the challenges that traders face on a very personal level. On that note, uh, regarding today's topic, we're seeing uh, a really an increase lately in the use of price action and tape reading by those in the program, and uh, some pretty solid evidence that it is increasing success rate rates for those traders taking the time to understand how they can use this information intuitively in their trading plan. Uh, we're going to start take a look here at 
the pit. This is the S&P pit picture from above, uh, probably pretty close to its heyday, nice and packed. A lot of people in there. Uh, the market's job is and always has been to facilitate trade. And as smaller speculators or speculators at all, our job, other than to provide liquidity and transfer risk, is to find ways to profit by finding uh, ways to fi figure out who's in control of the market at that time, be they buyers, sellers, using any number of tools and techniques. In the pit, before screen trade, when a major player was entering the, the marketplace, we had the luxury of being able to see them executing large positions. Sometimes those positions would take longer periods of time to execute. Uh, and to be able to gain an intuition for the kind of conviction or urgency they were entering the market with. Uh, the, the commercial players were visible. You've got a few of them pointed out here. They're not necessarily directed uh, pointing to exactly the person who was filling, but this is the general area where these companies conducted their business from. So if you were standing in the pit, you could literally see Bear Stearns, Lehman, Beige, Merrill Lynch. You knew who the broker was. You could see what they were doing. Um, you were also able to see the, the brokers that were... Uh, uh, retail brokers, your smaller retail traders, you were able to see some of the longer term, larger speculators like Sovereign Wealth. We all knew where these orders were coming from and uh, who was filling them. So we really had a, a fantastic way to uh, see the players as they were coming in. We don't have that luxury anymore, but standing in the pit meant having the ability to read the price action in a real time manner, gaining a sense of what the other time frame players were thinking doing as well as what the speculative community was experiencing. You could literally watch the local community trading with commercial entities and feel in the local community the smaller speculators were getting too long or too short and use this information to profit in short-term ways. Just by knowing the type of business a broker was filling, you could gain a sense of what the major players, larger speculators, and retail traders were thinking and experiencing. It was valuable information. Uh, although there was a lot of information coming at you very quickly with the help of some simple tools, I feel it was all the information you needed to gain an intuition about market direction and price pressure. It was all right in front of you. Uh, like any kind of market analysis, the skills took time to develop and use intuitively, at times at great cost, but doing the work, reviewing and validating the findings, and consistent application of these ideas created success for many traders. I don't want to say that it was in any way easy. The traders at that time went through the same rigors, the same uh, learning curves that traders do now. Uh, excuse me for one second, ladies and gentlemen. I apologize. I've been fighting a little bit of a cold, and I just uh, had to uh, take care of something there. So please forgive me. Uh, so the traders then in the pit experienced a lot of the same things that we're doing on screen. We have this; they had the same issues, the same challenges, and it was, uh, believe me, just as difficult. Having a little trouble changing my slide here. Here's the new pit, uh, reading the tape. This is a subject that's been pretty well covered since the days of the ticker tape, of course. It goes back to when they used to stand around the ticker tape and wa just watch what stocks were trading, how often, what direction price was moving. And this is how they based a lot of their decisions. It's my goal to inform you of the increasing level of success that we are seeing uh, by traders in the Top Step Trader program who are incorporating uh, some of these ideas into their trading plans, and hopefully to increase the probability of success for all who, who attend or watch this webinar in the future. Keep in mind that gaining an intuition into reading the dome or ladder in time and sales takes time, and that I'm well aware that some platforms have tools that traders can use to aid them in these efforts, but for the purposes of this webinar, I'm going to focus solely on the dome or ladder 
and market history, also known as time and sales. The uh, dome or ladder in time and sales contain the same information in real time and are really kind of the new trading pit. The naked eye will never be able to catch all the trades or bids and offers in the dome. In the trading pit, it was also impossible to see everything that was going on, depending on your geography, where you're standing in the pit, things happen behind you. You could never catch all the transactions and bidding and offering that were going on, especially on busy days. Uh, between the dome and time and sales, all the transactions are visible. You can be pretty quick. Uh, though it is impossible to determine, to determine the source for sure. So uh, we really need to begin to understand how certain trading entities appear and some of the techniques they use to enter and exit the market, as well as how activity and volume give you valuable information about the price pressures we're all looking to take advantage of. Walking around the trading floor, looking at floor traders uh, on their screens, and this is what we see in a lot of cases. They, they don't use charts on their screens. They line up the domes of the markets they're watching next to each other and have developed an intuition for how these markets relate to each other, as well as how to detect what kind of activity they are seeing in the market. Uh, simply the way the dome or the ladder moves in correlated and inversely correlated markets they watch creates the signals for them to react. Reading the dome in time and sales can be most useful for producing signals long before they appear in the structure of any chart. Charts, while of course are very useful for structure and verification of market hypotheses, are history. Pattern recognition is important and useful, but the best trade locations are often gone by the time the chart structure verifies your trade. What you are seeing in the ladder and the time of sales is happening in real time. It comes down to volume and the price pressures that volume creates. Uh, it is my opinion, and I think most will agree, that the vast majority of volume and risk transfer in the U.S. markets still happens during the open outcry sessions, even in the electronic markets, making the information, to me, more valid. More valid. Volume equals verification. Uh, trading at night requires taking into account the reduced commercial activity and also a keen eye for predatory traders. The tape exists without the charts. The charts do not exist without the tape. On a personal note, I've uh, I've had my doubts about the ability to read tape, and if there's a, that vo much validity to uh, reading the time and sales, reading what's going on right in the in the ladder or the dome. Um, uh, but uh, the traders here at Top Step Trader, as well as some research and a lot of journaling on my own, have proven to me that uh, it is very much possible to get a sense for what kind of activity you are seeing in the, in the, uh, in the dome and in time and sales and, uh, and uh, what kind of validity you're seeing in increases and decreases in volume at certain levels. And uh, I, it has become a very important part of, of trading to me and also an important part of trading to a lot of traders at Top Step Trader. So uh, you got to uh, in my opinion, be able to read the new pit. So, uh, excuse me one second, ladies and gentlemen, I do apologize. Hope you feel better soon, John. <laughs> I know it's tough. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, this this thing is uh, is uh, is uh, being pretty pretty sticky, pretty hard. So, uh, thank you though. So we're going to take a look at some of the concepts of reading the tape. Uh, just have a few simple slides, nothing too tremendous here. Uh, price action and participation. I'm waiting for this thing to switch for me. This is taking a minute. I do apologize. There we go. Price action and participation. 
how price acts and the, the participation present at price points you consider critical is one of the first considerations of execution. First thing I consider is the trade location. For example, are we executing a trade in an area of previous, previous acceptance or rejection? Are we at the extremes of the range or are we in the middle of the range? Another question, does activity seem to be increasing in the direction of the trade? Is price action slowing, or speeding up, and what kind of volume action are you seeing? Does it appear that volume is increasing or decreasing? Particularly important to me at the extremes. What side of the market is trading most? Trading more on the offer indicates that buyers are actually having to take action in order to get the trade. They have to lift the offer and vice versa. If more, uh, if more trade is occurring on the bid, sellers are, are, are moved to take action. And does the activity seem to be short-lived or sustained? Example, a stop run. A stop run would be an example of short-run, uh, uh, short-lived activity. We're going to take a look at how to recognize these, these uh, stop runs in a, in a few minutes here. At the day's extremes, and at known or anticipated points of support and resistance, gaining an, intu an intuition for seeing whether other time frame money is moving into or out of the market will prove to be a great asset to any trader. And again, we are seeing greater success for the traders, a top step trader, or who are gaining this intuition and using it in their trading. Uh, the opening call, I think, is a really good example of price action and being able to see what kind of uh, activity is coming into the market. In the three minutes, uh, in the in the in the brief period, maybe the three minutes before the open, uh, you you might be able to see evidence of aggressive other time frame control. Uh, you can see the market rally or weaken in the few minutes before the opening bell. Now I'm talking about uh, in the S and P's. Uh, we're sitting outside the S and P pit. We're we're watching what the minis are doing, and uh, from time to time you can see uh, as the uh, as the open outcry open nears. Uh, activity start to pick up and you might get an indication in that three minutes before and the three minutes after uh, about other time frame activity or a lack thereof aggressive control uh, from the opening bell or even before is one of the first indications of a possible day that's going to trend in a particular direction all day at least take a good drive in that direction. There was a great example about a month ago. Uh, the the S&Ps rallied uh, about a buck and a half before the open, and right on the opening bell, somebody popped an order in there and must have bought a couple of thousand S&Ps because it jumped up two handles, and that was the dead low of the day. Uh, that was uh, that was a, uh, a great example of how other time frame control can can begin even before the, the uh, open outcry. Um, opening. Uh, in the dome, uh, well, we just talked about that. Uh, the opening range is also a very useful reference point in early day type determination. Uh, like I just mentioned, uh, when the opening range is left at the extreme, like the example day that I just mentioned, uh, that was a day that, uh, that trended strongly in that direction all day. Uh, if there is no obvious um, uh, other time frame control right uh, right from the opening bell. It may be an indication of a day that may tend to range. Uh, and of course that control can change at any time. Sometimes you'll the market will open, you'll get a test and then a drive in the opposite direction. But using that opening range to me in early trade is uh, one of the most important uh, uh, um, levels to kind of keep an eye on at least uh, at least for the first half an hour. Uh, how the market acts around the opening range, uh, above it and below it. Uh, noticing the activity above and below the opening range can give you some valuable clues as to possible other time frame control. Uh, so we're going to take a look at recognizing the players. A very hard thing to do. Uh, it does take uh, some time and some intuition and some journaling and some study of how the price moves. 
uh, recognizing the players uh, with the anonymity in uh, the electronic markets today, recognizing the type of activity, whether it's commercial, large speculator, or small speculator, in the latter, and time in sales is, of course, to say the least, difficult. Gaining intuition for recognizing the probable players currently applying price pressure through activity takes some time, but can be very important to, see, to your success as a futures trader. When you're taking a look at commercial activity, these are the real players who make markets move and the players that we are really or should be trying to sniff out and side with. Uh, the sheer size and frequency of the trade in the dome in time and sales are the best indication whether other time frame players are active in the market. Sustained directional price activity. In, for example, possibly the trend day can indicate other time frame activity. Ice orders, of course, going to be other time frame activity. Even ranging or consolidating markets can be good indicators of commercial activity at the extremes of the consolidation. You've got obvious levels of demand and supply there. Uh, given uh, changes in, in market state or breakouts, uh, from an oscillating or ranging market created by other time frame activity or news and government reports can create great signals through volume and price action. Uh, looking at speculative activity, there are so many layers of speculative activity in the marketplace, different time frames, risk appetites and tolerances, opinions, tools, studies, and account sizes. Uh, make up the difference of opinion and liquidity that allow the other time frame players to enter and exit the market easily. Stop runs, I, I'm, I'm finding and I'm somewhat speculating, are usually made up of the layers of short-term speculators getting too long or too short, much the way uh, the locals used to in the pit and needing to liquidate their positions. Uh, these are among the easiest spots to move, in my opinion. And I, like, like I mentioned, we're going to take a look at, at spotting some of the, how these uh, these uh, uh, runs and uh, activity can be spotted. Recognizing popular areas of support and resistance will keep you away from the herd mentality trains or trades or, or lemming trades, I like to call them, and put you into a into a position to recognize the stop runs that take these traders out. The predatory traders and high frequency traders sometimes, uh, well, they, they use this information to enter the market against these stop runs. This is valuable information to keep in mind. Going with the herd is not in your best interest. Um, on to the HFTs and algos. Uh, HFTs create most of the noise in the market, and while they uh, might be credited with creating liquidity and volume, uh, they're they can be predatory in nature and often flash orders that are never meant to be filled in order to chase the market to places of opportunity for them. Uh, they're responsible for, for a lot of the chasing out of the herd mentality trades, but as long as you're aware of them, meaning those herd mentality trades, and the fact that the HFTs chase them out quite a bit, uh, I believe you can avoid much of the trouble they, call, they cause for smaller speculators and at times even beat them at their own game. Uh, when you see them switch sides, quite often they have just chased a herd of traders out of the market and they're now flashing the market to the direction of the trade uh, that the small herd was expecting. Their programs sense order flow and the messages sent to the exchanges in effect are reading the tape themselves. Uh, the locals in the pit used to do the same thing. They would stand and bid and offer both sides of the market. If they were buying 30s and selling 40s at the same time, they were making a nice little profit. Uh, from time to time, they would uh, they would end up a little bit too long at 30, and w watching the 30 bids uh, uh, diminish, they would just turn and 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 sell 30. So instead of making a tick on the trade, they'd scratch the trade and then set up again at the new bid and offer. They did a, quite a bit of the same things that the HFTs are doing now, even down to the way uh, that the HFTs go stop hunting. Uh, locals used to try and apply price pressure to move markets to, pl to places where they suspected there may be some stops and they were always hungry to take the other side of those stops. Um, so the HFTs really are kind of the scalpers in these markets. They're making lots and lots of little, tr little trades for a tick or two. 
uh, and it makes it very difficult uh, for the traders who are trying to do the same thing discretionarily. Uh, if you're thinking you're seeing HFT activity, you probably are, but in the grand scheme of things, I think they wield very little uh, long-term directional influence. And if you want evidence of that, just take a look at your uh, look at your ladder before a major economic release, because uh, they all just disappear. They they won't, they're not going to play in that. They're not they're not actually in this to take risk, and uh, and uh, just to try and make that little tick. That's what that's all they want. Uh, so when do we when do you look for activity? If you sit there staring at the dome the whole time, it's gonna it'll make you a little bit crazy. Uh, the more the activity, the greater the verification of price pressure. Uh, in my opinion, trading during the day provides the most activity, of course, in volume and the best verification for price pressures. Uh, but you've got to keep in mind the time of day as well. Activity levels change throughout the day. For example, trading through the lunch hour usually slows and volume is reduced. Uh, you got to keep in mind the time of day because a, a representation of good activity is going to look different at these times than in the first two hours and the last two hours of the trading day. And when I say trading day, I'm pretty much talking about the electronic trade during the open outcry sessions. Uh, trading at night creates kind of a similar situation. Uh, distinguishing what is good activity and price pressure is an intuition that you're going to have to build if you are going to be trading at night. Uh, and you also have to remember this is, uh, um, um, excuse me, um, yeah, um, distinguishing what is good activity and price pressure is an intuition that will have to be created for the night session because it is different than the day session. You also, uh, need to remember to do this when entering uh, during the day session. Think about the time of day and what represents good activity during those times. Uh, although I believe there are clues to price pressure constantly available in the dome and in time and sales, uh, like I said, watching it constantly will make you crazy. It's very difficult to focus for that long. You can kind of, get up, kind of end up hypnotized and end up not even remembering what you have been seeing or looking for. Uh, pay close attention at critical areas, your levels of support and resistance, balance, rejection, value areas, highs, lows, opens, etc. Uh, when in a trade, during trade management, monitoring price action, and the dome or the ladder, uh, while structures being formed on the charts can be also a great tool for verification and create confidence in your trade. So what do we look for in the, in the dome or time and sales? We're looking for where the market is attempting to go and how good a job it is doing in getting there. We're looking for price action. Is the market acting right according to the situation? Stop runs. These, uh, to me, seem to be easy to, easy to spot. Uh, they tend to be very quick and usually at the extremes of the ranges or when there is a, uh, an extension of the range. Hang on, ladies and gentlemen, I apologize. Sorry, right, John, you're doing good. We know you're sick. I do apologize and thank you. Um, so stop runs, they tend to be very quick and I, I see them easiest at the extremes of the ranges, whether they're just nearing the extreme of the range or there's a, there's a range extension involved. They, they initially look like very urgent, real, other time frame activity, but price action quickly s slows or s even stops for a brief period immediately following a stop run. Once all those stops are cleaned out, Everybody, it seems like you know, everybody just, uh, if they were in a pit, would be standing around looking at each other going, what do, we, what do we do now? So if you don't detect a sustained increase in activity or aggression at this time, I will start to look for signs of failure at this point, and I will probably look to fade that stop run. When this situation occurs near a high or low of the session, they offer great trade location. You can sell near the high or on a new high, buy a new low. Uh, or near the low. And if a breakout does occur, the trade location offers very cheap information 
uh, the loss is small, quick, good information, and it leaves you ready to reassess the market and react accordingly. Breakouts uh, have become so much easier for me to spot uh, since I have been watching this time in sales, watching the dome at these points. And there are times when it's just I, I, I become so confident in what I'm seeing, and uh, it's really been a, a tremendous asset. Um, so breakouts can be spotted as the market leaves the, the area of previous acceptance or balance, and price action begins to increase. Uh, you see the price start jumping around. Volume indicates an increase in money flowing into the market in that direction of the breakout as trade begins to mostly occur on the offer if the market is breaking out to the upside or on the bid if the market is, is heading lower. Uh, when you get to these points, if you're going to be looking for failure, that failures sometimes will accompany a stop run. Even breakouts will sometimes be accompanied by a stop run. But when failures happen, the market just does not draw the interest. The money does not begin to flow into the market in that particular direction. And price action won't look the same. It will be slower. Uh, the volume won't pick up. Sometimes it will even just drop off to next to nothing. And at that time, uh, again, I'm thinking um, when I see a failure, I'm thinking for a fade. I'm a much better failure trader than I am a breakout trader. Um, breakouts tend to uh, cause me to um, react. Um, breakouts make me nervous. I just feel like my stop has to be too far away. So I'm a much better failure trader than breakout trader. I'm not the best trend trader either. So uh, these are things that I'm working in, and I'm getting better at breakouts because I'm able to recognize the type of activity, the amount of activity, and the, the price pressures that are, that are moving that market away from previous balance. So that brings us to the, your ICE orders. These are always a fascinating subject for everybody. Um, these are definitely of particular interest to tape readers. There are another time frame players executing large orders without giving indication in the order book or the dome or the ladder of what they really have to do. Bids and offers are placed in pieces and refreshed as they are exhausted. For example, if uh, somebody has a uh, 3000 to buy, they may place a bid in the, uh, in the ES for 300 As that bid nears exhaustion, another 300 pops in. That bid nears exhaustion, another 300 pop in until the entire order is executed. Very often in the case of a, in the case of a buy a ice order for this example, offers are placed above the market with no intent of ever being filled, just to make the market look heavy to entice speculators, smaller speculators, guys like you and me, to sell into the ice order. These orders above the market then just disappear as that ice order be, gets closer to being filled. And uh, you know, while it might seem like a dangerous game to play, so those same people working those ice orders, which is a program, also have a program. If those offers get uh, traded into by one contract, they're they're automatically pulled. Um, then there's the growler order, which is another kind of type of ice order, uh, but a little bit more uh, devious, if you ask me. They're very similar. It's a large larger time frame. Uh, a, a larger player that has a large order to execute. They enter the orders very similarly to the ICE orders, but they they allow the entire smaller piece of the of the larger package that they have to do. Say again, they have three thousand to buy. They'll put in three hundred. As soon as that three hundred is filled and the market goes offered at that price, they refresh it. They let the market actually turn offered at that price. And then they snap up all those offers and then continue working those bids. They'll do this over and over again. They're really they 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 can be hard to spot because they don't always use the same uh, the same quantity. They 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 use random quantities in ice orders and growlers. But one of the telltale signs for both of them is that they're going to try and place orders above the market to make the market look heavy, so that they can entice as many people to sell into them as possible. Now, when they're done with that order. You've, they've got all these short-term short, short -term traders, short, smaller speculators, short at that price. And if, the, if they're not going to get price action relatively soon in, in, the, in the downward direction, those speculators are going to start to run for the hills, which will only perpetuate the position for the other time frame 
um, uh, trader who who executed the ice order or the growler. So it's uh, it's important to try and develop a sense for these. I'm getting better at spotting them. But uh, when you see these things happen, you're going to have to be watching time and sales. Uh, it's going to look like um, it's going to look like you know there's really not mu that much there that the market looks heavy above, or of course bids below, making the market look seem stronger. Uh, but the uh, the way these orders are filled is very similar to the way we used to fill orders in the pit when we were given discretion. I had a customer that would come up to me and say, "John, I got two thousand S and P's to buy." Uh, you're not held, which means you're you're not held to the tick. You can take your time, you can work them. Um, let me know when you're done. So now I've got 2,000 S and P's to buy. I turn and face the pit, and I maybe bid for 100 and see if I get any. If I start getting hit on the bid, I keep working bids, 100 at a time until I have probably 1,500 of them bought. Now I've got the local community, good and short, and my instructions are to make the last 500 ugly. So now I've got 1,500 bought, and I take the other 500 to run the market up on the short locals and make the order look like it was filled by a genius. Same thing that they do with the ice orders and growlers. Uh, I could not tell people that I had 2,000 to buy. I was putting them in piece by piece, and uh, uh, that, that's just the way it was. So these ice orders and growlers, while they're hard to see, it wasn't that much easier to see a broker that had, um, uh, a, a, in order to fill at his discretion, like I just explained, uh, standing in the pit. If you were watching that particular broker, you could say, you know, he's bought probably a thousand cars and nobody even realizes it. A thousand contracts. Now he's up to fifteen hundred contracts. I'm glad I'm not selling into that. And then all of a sudden. I'm lifting offers and making the market look like it's going to the moon in order to make the order look like it was filled by a genius. So kind of the same thing that the brokers did back then. Uh, so we've been dealing with a kind of ice order and growler for a long, long time. Um, HFT noise is noise. Orders are entered and pulled so fast it's impossible to see. If your time frame is longer than that of a scalper, the HFT noise is going to be a nuisance. and. Uh, I don't. I try not to pay attention to it. I look at a longer time frame chart. Uh, if I see, you know, uh, what I suspect is HFT activity, um, then it just means that there's probably a little bit of liquidity in that area. Uh, when the market is really moving, I don't think the, that the HFTs are able to play. Uh, so what we're looking for is real activity. You want to find a. a you want to find and develop an intuition and be able to recognize real activity. Uh, with time practice and especially journaling. Uh, we're all working on trading plans, executing trading plans, trying to remain disciplined to our trading plans, and journaling is a big part of that. Uh, so along with the trades you're making, the journals you're doing, you've you got to kind of journal what you're seeing in the dome at these, at these places that you are interested in taking trades. I can't stress the importance of that enough. In my trading, I believe that journaling what I'm seeing in the dome uh, or the ladder or time and sales when I am executing a trade um, is part of the journaling now. It just it just has to happen. I believe that it has really, really um, shortened my learning curve as far as being able to recognize what's going on in the dome. Excuse me one second. Thank you. Just trying to pull up the next slide here. Why it's giving me a hard time. Uh, this was a slide I meant to put up for the ice orders showing kind of an example. This is just a uh, 
screenshot of the T4 time and sales the dome in, in a chart and uh, just kind of showing a, an example of what it might look like when there's an ice order being executed in the dome. We've got a couple of larger offers there. This isn't a, really a prime example, but uh, you get the idea. They're going to put a couple of layers of, of offers above the market trying to entice traders to sell into the ICE order. Uh, that This uh, time and sales isn't really indicative of it. This looks like there is an aggressive, uh, an, an aggressive buyer uh, that uh, moved up. Uh, Price from the from the uh, from the bid to the offer, buying those seventy fives. A pretty decent sized trade though, eleven hundred and fifty five uh, total. Um, so just a kind of a visual example of what it might look like if there is an ice order being executed in the dome. You're going to see offers that are never meant to be filled there. Uh, any commercial entity is probably not going to be hanging out their, tree, their, their true order. They're going to be piecing them in. And if you do see size, you can probably bet that there is a nice order nearby uh, the other direction. If you see size above, look for, look for evidence of a nice order below or at where current price is trading. Uh, if you see size below, look for an offer. Look for where they may be executing an ice order or a growler on the offer. Uh, it does take some time to begin to recognize, but that's one of the first signs you're going to see is that when they hang those offers or those bids out there, and uh, when you when you see them disappear, you know they're done. So there's a whole bunch of uh, there's some questions to ask yourself. When you're looking at the dome uh, to try and distinguish uh, possible price pressures, who is more aggressive? You got to look at the trade urgency. Certain trades we require greater urgent urgency when entering or exit the market. Uh, a good example would be uh, the stop run. The stop run looks like a very urgent situation, and it is for those who are getting out, for those whose stops are getting hit. Uh, other urgent times can be the opens and closes, of course. Or, or when reports or news comes out that have a profound effect on the collective perception of value. Aggression can be monitored by, uh, by seeing what side of the last price is trading more aggressively and with increasing volume. You always kind of want to be looking at which side of the market is trading more. You can sniff out other, other time frame traders that way, especially when you see uh, markets trending in one direction. It almost seems like the aggressive buyers put the bid there, they draw the line in the sand, they get as many bought there as they can until the market moves a little bit of a little bit away. They move that line in the sand up. They get as much bought at that level as they can, and so on and so forth. They repeat this, and uh, you, you can almost see it in your charts. It looks like us. It looks like steps. Markets have always moved that way. Your other time frame players have always operated that way, and they still do today. Uh, what side of the market is trading more? Of course, it, uh, it indicates who's really taking action, lifting bids or hitting offers. When you see what side of the market, um, it's even more vivid in the time and sales window. On the T4 platform, trades occurring on the bid appear red, indicating that sellers needed to take action in order to make that trade happen and hit the bid. Trades on the offer appear in blue, indicating that buyers needed to take action and lift the offer for these trades to occur. Uh, this distinction has proven very important in my own trading and I think in, uh, in, to a lot of the traders in the Top Step Trader program. Is the activity sustained? Seeing sustained activity in the dome or time and sales is what really alerts me to the presence of another time frame player, a commercial player, somebody who really moves the market. Stop runs and herd mentality trades don't, don't exhibit the same sustained activity as real players. Uh, ice orders, directional initiative, other time frame activity is what I'm looking for and what the traders in the program are successfully using the tape to look for and side themselves with. 
your trade location. How is my trade location? Um, to those who know me know I'm always a stickler for trade location. I'm always looking for the best location to take trades. Uh, and as the market approaches a good trade location, that's when my radar goes up and I really begin to focus on the activity in the dome and time and sales. It is very important to look at these with purpose. They're not just going to start talking to you. You've got to watch what's going on. You've got to be adding totals in your head. Um, you've, you've got to uh, really try and get involved in what you're seeing there. And that is when that intuition will really start to come out. And it doesn't happen right away. Uh, certain things are going to be easier to see. Certain things are going to take longer to develop an intuition for. And are you ever really going to know for sure 100% if that's what's going on? I'm not sure. But I have a good idea of what has been helping me. And I think I have a pretty good idea of what has been helping the, the, uh, the many, many traders in our program that are, that are starting to implement this uh, as part of their trading plans, being able to recognize the activity. Uh, so journal. Review these occasions. Are, um, are you journaling? You've got to journal your trades. You've got to review what you're doing. You've got to take a look at whether you are sticking to your trading plan. If you're not, try and find out why. Try and figure out how you can. Uh, it, it does take discipline. It does take time. It takes subtle changes applied consistently to make these changes. It's, it's, it's a habit. Um, so always journal. Uh, the tape, again, I said this earlier, and this, this, this statement just rings to me. The tape exists without the charts. The charts do not exist without the tape. Any chart and study that you can use comes from market information that has already happened. Uh, what happens in the new pit is in real time, and as close as what we used to watch for in the pit is we're going to get. Uh, I really was of the frame of mind that, uh, that pit traders needed to unlearn much of what they looked at for market feel in the pit. Now, what I'm, what I'm talking about is I'm not talking about scalpers. Uh, the scalpers don't have a place in the, in the, in the, in the, in the pit anymore, in the, in the open outcry pit. If you're not going to trade, that you're going to be executing a, a, an arbitrage between the pit traded contract and the ES and the, and, uh, between the, I'm sure, the big S&P and the ES. Uh, there are those that stand in the pit and do stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the market. They actually trade. Uh, they're much more similar to screen traders because they actually have to be right. If they're only reacting to uh, variance in price between the big contract and the, the E-mini, they're, they're basically arbitragers and their risk, the risk they're taking is minimal. Uh, they don't have to count on being right so much. Uh, so the, the, the Top Step Trader program and seeing traders improving and succeeding using tape reading techniques has really convinced me that there still is a very important part of, uh, of being a discretionary trader, and that is being able to read price action, being able to try and decipher what's going on in the time and sales and in the dome. And I hope I've given you some valuable hints to that. Uh, it does take journaling. I can't stress this enough to... to um, to, to, to start to make it intuitive, make it part of your daily program when you finish the day. You're journaling your trades. You're looking at what you did, why you did what you did, how you felt, and how you can do things better. Journal your thoughts about what the, you thought you were seeing in time and sales and in the dome while you were, while you were making these trades. Like most of trading, it's an art form, and it's going to take time and can some consistent uh, application to develop the intuition. But journaling, to me, is the only way I've found to, to commit what you're seeing to memory so you can use it intuitively in the future. And I'm finding it really doesn't take that long to begin to recognize some of these stop runs, ice orders, uh, real activity, and whether or not the activity is good at all in that, in that, uh, in that, in that case. Again, you can go crazy staring at the dome and expect it to talk to you. You've got to focus on some basic points. You want to focus on you know, buying versus selling. What's happening more? Who's more aggressive? Uh, you, you, want to tell, you want to try and decipher the type of activity, smaller or larger traders. Um, your HFTs are sensing when your smaller traders are placing bids in certain areas, the popular areas where 
uh, herd mentality trades are, are going to happen. They're fully aware. They, they receive the messages from the exchange. Um, they know when, they're, when these traders are moving their stops. Uh, you've got to try and uh, get a sense of the type of activity that you're looking at. Uh, your market's particular personality, though a market is a market, basically it's just an auction. Each market does have its own personality and its own level of participation from some of these participants that we've talked about, your commercials, your, your larger speculators, smaller speculators, HFTs. Uh, each market has a kind of a different level to all of these things. There are levels that the, there, there are markets the HFTs like that they don't like. Um, you got to be um, focusing on when trade is slowing or even just not happening. Uh, you got to focus on how much size does it take uh, to break your market out. How much do you need to see trade? What represents good activity in your market? In the depth of market at key levels, how does it act? Tape reading, really. Uh, Uh, it's, uh, it can be the foundation of all discretionary trading systems. Uh, charts, trading systems, it all comes from the tape. Mastering the tape can make all the difference in the world in your trading. Again, wasn't a believer, I am now. A tape reading gets to the meat and bones of what the market is. Really, it's an auction. You always be thinking of it as an auction. Uh, and in the battle between buyers and sellers in any market, auction process, the tape really can help lead the way to profits. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, I've uh, inspired you to start to take a look at it, given you some key points to start to look at. Uh, there is a lot of information coming at you. There's a lot to look at. There's a lot that, that we don't really necessarily have time to discuss right now. And, but keep in mind that nothing works all the time. The, the market's information, it's all imperfect. It's all irregular. Uh, but any tool or intuition uh, that increases your probability of success should be considered. Uh, trade your plan with consistent rules and intuition, and you'll limit your risk and increase your probabilities of success. At Top Step Trader, tape reading has proven a valuable tool to many of our traders, me included now. Um, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for their time, um, for trusting me with their time. And uh, hopefully there's uh, some things that you're able to carry forward from this webinar and, uh, and uh, to, uh, to increase your probabilities of, of success and uh, be successful traders. Whoops. And I want to offer you, everybody that uh, attended this webinar, uh, if you receive a half off a member, uh, your first month as a Top Step Trader member. When you sign up, use the scouting prospect code BIGMIKES50. And again, thank you all for attending, and uh, I, I hope that uh, you found some useful information and things you can carry forward to succeed with. Thanks, John. Really appreciate it. And uh, so now I want to invite everyone to go ahead and start asking their questions. And while I'm waiting for those to come in, I made a few notes along the way, so I'm going to ask my questions first. Um, Please do. <laughs> so... Uh, first, I want to talk about the, the, uh, the various time frames that are in control of the market, and I want to get your opinion on this. So the way I kind of look at it is that you can see this evident at different times of day. Uh, I mean, you know, I think everyone's kind of aware of, you know, hedge fund Mondays or maybe the first and last day of the month. Um, but don't you see certain times of the day, uh, obviously the morning and afternoon is the most prevalent, where uh, you you tend to see more trends. I, I think there's more trends at those times of day, which I think is primarily driven from uh, bigger, longer time frame traders that are opening or closing positions. You know, at the at the beginning or at the end of the day. What what is your thought press thought process on actually identifying these uh, bigger time frame traders, and what what does it look like if you're looking? you know, at a chart or if you're looking at your DOM, what does it look like as these, these guys initiate trades? Okay. All right. Um, my favorite tool for trying to sniff out um, other time frame activity in chart structure is, is market profile. I think the, the, the profile really paints a vivid picture of where balance is and also gives great indication of where, when that balance changes, when the situation changes, and one of those other time frame traders um, 
comes into the market and begins to and begins to move the market away from established balance. Now, what when I see, uh, for example, if the S and P's uh, have been trading in a narrow range for the majority of the day, um, at that point, I'm I'm looking at the high and the low of uh, that range as supply and demand. Uh, sellers were willing to sell it up near the highs. Buyers were willing to buy it near the lows. Whether they're longer time frame commercials or um, just kind of the market running out of gas and speculators don't want to pay that high or don't want to sell that low anymore, it kind of creates a supply and demand situation. Uh, recognizing within that profile who is winning the battle between the buyers and sellers if there is commercial activity present is is difficult and very vague. Uh, there are some techniques in profile uh, which I'm, which I'm sure many of you are aware of, watching the TPO count, uh, watching to see if the point of control moves higher or lower, and in situations where I avoid the middle of the range like the plague, I don't like to, to trade in the middle of the range, um, but uh, when the market is driven away from that, that's when I'm looking for uh, the kind of activity that uh, that uh, um, that you're talking about, the commercial activity, the sustained. Um, the sustained one-sided right. um, activity. Uh, you know, it's uh, if the market is driven away from that balance and uh, is spending a lot of time it, just even at the high of that range and not giving anything back. Uh, you know, like the S and P's will uh, on, a, on some days they'll, they'll open, they'll trend higher for the first half of the day, and then they'll they'll be stuck in a two-dollar range or a three-dollar range right at the top. Um, I've tried to sell into those a few times. It, it, it never works. Uh, if you're going to trade those, that's where the new balance is, and that's where these other time frame traders are holding that market up. Uh, sometimes those can be viewed as short covering rallies, but for, for whatever reason, there's enough, uh, there's enough energy to hold that market up in that, in, that, in that level. Now, when there's a situational change where, well, let's say, you've got a very, you've got that P-shaped uh, that P-shaped profile, uh, now the market begins to trade down below the P, and if it starts to take out the thinner parts or the single ticks in that profile, that, that alerts me to uh, there's either a change in the collective perception of value that everybody, so maybe something came out, something happened, or uh, the other time frame players that drove the market up there are no longer present and they've attracted some sellers. Yeah, we, um, we so saw what them. I'm going to be looking for is... I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say that we saw that a lot actually recently in the S and P, where uh, you know we would we would see a lot of absorption, and that was actually the second thing I wanted to ask you about is is absorption at certain levels, uh, like like recently in the S and P is where we see price. Let, let, let's just uh, theorize that yesterday a lot of people were trying to short what they perceived to be a top in the S and P's, and price was not going anywhere. You know, we were just absorbing all that selling. Uh, right. You know, like you said, you you could say, you know, whether I know everybody looks at it, you know, there's long liquidation, there's short covering, but absorption is or consolidation or whatever you want to call it, I think happens uh, usually before you see a big move. Right. And and I think most people in this webinar are probably aware, but the markets are obviously range bound much more than they are trending. And you, right. you mentioned, you know, that that you're still not the uh, the best trend trader. But you know what? That's. That's you know if you're a good range trader then you're you're probably doing just fine. Um, yeah, it it's uh it's been um it's uh it's been interesting but uh you, you know as long as as long as I stick to my rules and I I avoid trying to catch breakouts and trends until I figure out how to do it <laughs> I'm I'm going to be okay but uh the absorption you're talking about the S&P's have been doing it for 20 Five years well, since they opened, it just seems that the that the stock market is built to rally, and every time it gets to a level that attracts a bunch of selling, a bunch of new shorts come in, it eats them. It eats shorts all the way up. It, it'll it'll go up. It'll eat those shorts, and of, of course, that's borrowing any disastrous news. Um, sure. it, it'll it'll let you get short. It'll it might even give you a little bit of a hint of price action in your direction, <laughs> just to entice you, and and, yeah. and then and then it eats you. Yeah. Um, and I know a lot of uh, one of the most successful traders I ever knew. Um, I said, you know, what, what, what did you do that created this success? And he looked at me and he said, I learned to buy them. 
because there was a huge mentality on the trading floor that you make your money a lot faster on the short side than the long side. And a lot of the locals yeah, in the S and P's got really good at picking those tops and yep. making money on the short side, and then you know trying to wait for the next time the next opportunity. Another I, successful I think it's trader the opposite. told me. You know, I, I think that may, maybe the market moves faster. Maybe there's a time component of the short side, but I think that there's always going to be more money on the upside. You know, always more money on the bullish side. It's just the way our world works, you know. And, you know, don't get me wrong. I think that the economy and everything is doing terrible, even though we're at, you know, all these highs in the market. And there's going to be some type of a doomsday correction at some point. But until that event happens, you know, you really got to favor the, the longs, I think because that's what's paying and uh, you know just be prepared for that doomsday event that may happen one day maybe we'll see that the S&P is trading down at 600 again you know a lot of people think they should but until that happens you know uh, everything else says longs Overall. no I I completely I completely agree with you I think it's built to rally and it only gets knocked down when there's disastrous situations uh, it's uh, you know uh, I I've learned to buy them too but I think the mentality for the short side came from uh, the the locals, the the guys in the pit. You know, they weren't the most disciplined people, and they were very into instant gratification. So the faster that money could come, the happier they were. Right, and then of course, you know, it used to be that you have a lot of funds and things that uh, you know couldn't short. So it's just kind of like a free fall, you know, uh, whenever the right. things started yep. to go down. So anyway, let me let me jump into some of these questions from the guys here. Um, Okay, so uh, Karim says, you know, it's good to ha it's a good idea to have the ticker open and to start absorbing some of the information that it provides uh, until you start seeing patterns and volume flows that you recognize consistently. But uh, you know, how how long how long does it take for you to see these patterns and you know really understand what you're seeing you know, before you can start actually implementing putting into practice what you're what you're seeing on the screen? Okay, uh, great question. Of course, it's going to vary from person to person. Everybody has their own d desires, aptitudes, uh, um, and, uh, and and abilities. Uh, for me, I started really kind of taking a look at it in uh, probably about a year ago, and when I started to see evidence that I was starting to recognize some patterns, and I was starting to get a better sense of you know when breakouts were likely to happen, when they were going to fail, I started to journal it. So now whenever I'm in a situation where I'm uh, thinking of taking a trade, I'm focusing on price action, and, I'm, and when the trade is on, I'm watching price action. Of course, I'm doing my best to stick to my trading plan, but um, uh, it's, it's been about six months since I started journaling it. And now uh, when we get to the extremes of the range, whether it's a range day or not, whether it's a, or a day that's extending, a trend day, I'm able to recognize a lot better when there's actual when it seems like there's actual money moving into to the market in that direction, uh, or when there isn't. You know, if if it gets to that point and it falls off, then I'm thinking, okay, this is a great fade. I'm short, and it's and it's the recognition is a lot faster. Yeah, I, it seems. I'm glad to hear you emphasize journaling because, as you know, I'm a huge uh, uh, person that encourages journaling to really reveal some truths to you because I think that uh, the mind has a really spectacular way of convincing you that something happened a certain way when it when it really didn't you know memory is a very funny thing uh, putting it on paper putting it you know in a thread on BMT or putting it in Excel or whatever you use to journal can really help uh, make that apparent so I, I, I encourage everyone to do that Absolutely, and you know, write, writing it down and, and reviewing it and thinking about it and putting yourself back in that place really just reinforces how quickly you're going to make right. that part of your instinct right. and, and be able to use it. We had a, a really great webinar a couple of weeks ago uh, that you can check out on BMT that goes over how to make your journal work for you. I recommend it to everybody. Okay, um, so Mike has a question. He says it's, it's his understanding that the market makers on the exchange see all the price levels on the DOM where retail only sees 10 levels. Can the market makers see the stop levels better because of being able to see the resting orders? So I, I, I want to attempt to answer this, and then, John, if I'm wrong or if you know, then let me know. My understanding is that market makers have what's called like level three, where they see the full book. Um, but, you know, don't worry. They would never use that information against you, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> you know, what, what, what's your experience with that, John? Okay, well, uh, 
standing, sitting where I'm sitting, I'm watching the S&P pin, I'm watching the Dow pin. The traders in there that also have handhelds and are able to execute on screen, they have, they have less of an order book than we do. The difference between the order book that they see and, what, and that we see, I, th I think they see about five or six price levels above and below where the last trade is. But they also see the number of orders that comprise that number of contracts bid for or offered. Right. You know, in the in the HFT webinar that uh, Eric from Nanex did uh, with DTN IQ feed a couple months ago, you know, I don't want to get into any kind of conspiracy theory stuff, but my understanding is that literally every single order is tagged with a unique ID. So, you know, right. everyone, the SEC has the capability to know exactly who initiated every single order and that that information is there in the feed. Um, so that if you're a market maker, my understanding, if anyone knows that I'm wrong, let me know, that you have access to that information, which means that it is entirely possible, and Eric touched on this in the webinar, where, you know, from an algorithm standpoint, you can you can keep tabs on uh, on literally individual traders um, you know, putting orders in the market and, uh, you know, obviously there's going to be huge advantages and I don't know what the legal ramifications are of using those advantages, but like I said, you know, I wouldn't worry about that. It's not like they write the regulations or anything. Um, so let's move on to some other questions. <laughs> That's scary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and, uh, uh, Eric from Nanex, you know, was just on uh, Capital Account today, Lauren Lister's show, and he was. I'm, I'm eager to watch it after the webinar is done. I hope that he gave the SEC a, a good railing because, you know, they're they're really falling on their face when it comes to regulating some of this stuff. Uh, okay, so uh, George wants to know: Do you have any recommendations on like books and things that uh, you know that can go deeper into what you're talking about, tape reading? Hmm. In particular books, no. I, I don't have a recommendation for that. I, I'm sure that there are some out there. Uh, my research was pretty much uh, in what I've been experiencing, what the people in the program have been experiencing, and talking to other traders on the floor who uh, are, you know, for example, the guys who have the five domes up next to each other. What are you looking for? Uh, how do you recognize these things? How am I recognizing these things? And just basically, as part of this, uh, the floor community looking at uh, uh, interviewing traders and saying, you know, how are, how are you recognizing these? How, what are you looking for? Uh, and actually, uh, on, on most of what I discussed today and most of the way I'm looking at these things, I'm not too far off from, from the way uh, most of the traders are, uh, at least on the floor. Uh, you know, we're, we're not looking at uh, unique order IDs or anything like that, but uh, um, just from the experience of the traders around me, the traders in the program, my own experience, and uh, uh, you know, I, I looked around a little bit on the on the internet. Uh, you know, the, everybody pretty much says the same thing, so that kind of leads me to believe whatever book, whatever internet you're looking at, whatever whatever site you're looking at, whoever you're listening to, uh, it's 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 an in intuition that you've got to kind of develop for yourself. Uh, I was um, doing this to try and let everybody know that uh, we're seeing greater success in our program with people that are that are beginning to read the tape and develop that intuition. It is increasing uh, my probabilities of successful trades. I can tell you that much for sure. And right. uh, and the more I looked into it, the more I found that even floor traders that are they have the screens in front of them, they are watching. They are watching to see all the things that we just discussed. And uh, and you know, there is there a clear picture? I mean, can you say, okay, this is absolutely an ice order or this is absolutely a breakout? There never is. I wish there was. Right. Uh, and I'm sure that there's great resources that probably go into greater detail than, than I'm able to or, or, or have time to today. Um, and as I, as I find them, I will see if I can't uh, like look through them, see, see if I can come up with something that uh, that uh, that I can definitely recommend that people should read, and I'll definitely put it on the site. Right. Yeah, I I'm not aware of any real good books uh, either, but uh, I'll try to put on the on the main discussion thread for this webinar. There's probably at least three or four uh, big threads on BMT that go into this subject uh, in in detail. There's also several people that have tried to write indicators 
to uh, specifically detect or track iceberg orders and such. So uh, you guys, uh, especially if you're on NinjaTrader, you can take a look at that. Um, Arnie asks, can you uh, shed some light on the herd mentality that you talked about? Is there a way that you can kind of, uh, you know, identify this these levels, or are you are you just looking at like an aggregate of the volume and time and sales to, to tell you that that's where the herd is? Uh, I think the herd mentality trade uh, is is more of a, um, a a time frame and tool issue. Uh, if you uh, if you get a kind of a, a confluence of uh, your one minute chart lookers, your five minute chart lookers, and your your thirty minute chart lookers, um, and they're using let's say for example a very common tool your simple moving averages your 50 your 100 and your 200 when you get a situation where some of those moving averages on 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 those different time frame charts might be near the same area you're going to get a lot of speculators that are using these simple moving averages as support and resistance and taking trades there uh, and uh, I believe the HFTs whether or not they can see unique order IDs or anything like that um, they're sensing that order flow. I know that they sense the messages that go, that go to the exchange. Uh, and so they see situations where at certain price levels you get uh, a boatload of one and two lot bids. Uh, so now they're, they're, they've identified that this specific price area has small speculators fascinated. Um, they also are aware of pretty much what kind of heat these small tech speculators are going to be able to take on these trades. If these speculators get filled on these, the HFTs are going to continue doing what they're doing, but they, they're, they, I, they're, they're going to start to tr flash orders to make the market look like it's heavier than it is. Uh, locals did it, have done it in the pit forever. If you had a big short position and the market was going your way, Every every once in a while, you would throw a down tick in there just to make the tape look weak. Wow, it looks like you know it was it was just half bid. Now there's a ten trade, uh, just to make it look like it. So they let everybody get in, and they they'll try and do what they can to muscle the market into their stops where they're already working bids. Just the way right. the locals used to go stop hunting. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, so to uh, when I'm looking at a trade, I'm also looking at. You know what? What I'm, I know what I'm thinking. What are what are, what are all the other small speculators thinking? Because if 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 this is a spot that I believe a lot of other people are going to be taking trades, I'll be a little, I'll be stingier with my trade location. I might even try and get into that trade where I believe all these stops are going to be. So that's right. one way that you you might be able to beat these guys at their own game. Yeah, let, let's talk about that for a minute. So Steve is asking. If you use market profile, and I and I know that you do, so let's talk about trade location, uh, in combination with um, to borrow a term from uh, Futures Trader seventy one, he calls it stalking the trade. So like, if you have a trade location in mind based on your profile, uh, then you're watching the DOM, you're you're watching for absorption, you're watching for any clues of iceberg orders or whatever to give you a clue. Um, or another example would be like what you just talked about, where a possible trade location would come from. Uh, where well, you know a lot of stops are, you know, let's say that there's a breakout that fails, um, you know that uh, the stops for that fail is going to fuel the the run back in the other direction. So, sure. what what are you looking at on the DOM? You know, after you've identified a trade location, which I'm I'm assuming, correct me if I'm wrong, that you're using profile or some other tool to give you an idea of where to be looking, and then you switch over to the DOM. To, to see if you know this is a good location to get in or to try to time it is that right yeah in some cases um, I'm gonna look at the uh, at the dome before execution uh, if I'm if I've identified a range trade uh, if, if we get up above if we get up to the high of value or even you know peak above the high of value I'm probably going to take that trade uh, regardless of what the tape says uh, now I'm gonna monitor the tape um, uh, because it's good trade location, because if it does break out, if it does indicate that the, that breakout is going to be true, uh, it's a cheap trade. Uh, it's information that I'm paying for, but it's still a cheap trade. And I've had, um, uh, you know, uh, being a, a range trader, that's that's been my game. So uh, being aware that every trade's not going to be a winner uh, when when the market gets up there, unless the situation has changed. Uh, you know, I'm I'm kind of always keeping an eye on on the price action. You know, if, if the price is wandering up there, uh, it doesn't seem to really have any 
conviction or direction that I'm noticing in the, in the dome, I'm taking that trade and I'm going to monitor price activity while that trade is on to see if I can see an indication, okay, you know, this, something's not right here because this thing is holding up here too long or price action is starting to pick up, volume's starting to pick up and it's above value. It's making me a little bit nervous. I may actually ditch the trade to, uh, before I even get to, to get stopped out. Right. Uh, you, you know, I've, I've been faked out that way too. Uh, but you know, I, I'm always ready to get the position back on as long as the good trade location uh, remains and um, and uh, and price action and, and participation are indicating that I, you know, maybe I was wrong in ditching this thing. Well, we saw um, we saw that happen today a little bit. You know, as we as we came down and made a new low around uh, 48 or so, I think it was. Uh, we saw some very little participation wanting to go lower and then of course you know the whole Google fiasco fueled this and then they reopened yeah, and right. Google started moving higher and we saw a lot of buyers coming back in uh, and we had a really nice uh, uh, distribution today but uh, you know like you said a lot of times you know if you're if you're right at the outside of value you know if it doesn't start coming back you know into value right away then that's obviously a clue that that you might have like a double distribution day um, to start and move further outside of value instead of returning back Sure. Um, so I don't want to go off on market profile. Uh, Craig has a, <laughs> a, a, a question. And by the way, I, I think that you you intend to do a market profile webinar one of these days, right? So for anybody that um, you know is is keen on that, you know that'll be on the books at some point. Uh, hopefully, I'm not putting you on the spot there. <laughs> yeah. All sure. Right. Uh, okay. So no, Craig. Not all. Not all. <laughs> all right. So Sorry. Craig says. Uh, John, can you briefly uh, explain or give an example of someone leaning on the bid or offer? Okay. Um, in the pit, uh, we'll start with that. In the pit, uh, there there may be a, a Goldman offering uh, an order three hundred at even. The locals in front of them would stand there and sell ninety fives all day long, knowing that that offer was right behind them. If they got price action their way. Now, you know, they're selling 95s or, well, I mean, this is a long time ago when S&Ps traded in nickels. Now they trade in dimes. So you got locals standing in front of them selling 90s. They're going to sell 90s until they get to about to the point where they're, they're about even with the offer behind them. God forbid the offer behind them gets pulled. But um, back when the, when the pit was really busy, if you, were, if you had a broker behind you, you could lean on his offers or bids that way and risk a tick to make four or five. If the market moved away from that, you, you had the opportunity to make, you know, four, five, ten, to however many ticks you were willing to hold out for. Uh, in the dome, if you see a size offer in the S&Ps, you know, you're seeing 1,500, 1,500, 1,500, all of a sudden you see 4,000 on the offer at, at four even, and you put an offer in to sell uh, 375. That would be kind of leaning because you're thinking, okay, you know, I can sell this 375, and if I see the four even start to trade out, maybe I can go to the market and just pay four even. So I can risk a tick, and if it goes half off or quarter off, or I, maybe I can bid evens and make three ticks. That would be an example of, of right. leaning on an order. Um, it was hugely, you know, guys made livings doing that in, in, in the pit. Uh, but you you had to be quick. You know, somebody came and took that 300 lot offer out in front of you, and you still had 50 95s. You were short and nowhere to go with them. You were going to have a problem. And yeah, it did happen. Uh, and we didn't have the minis to guide anything then, so you didn't know. You know, you're selling all these 95s. Merrill Lynch may turn to Goldman and say, "Buy them now. They're gone. Now what are you going to do?" <laughs> right. But more often than not, they had the opportunity to cover these for, for a better reward than they were risking, which was a tick. Right. All right. So, uh, I, John, I just want to let you know and everybody, everyone else in the room that right now uh, the questions that, I, that we're asking are about uh, 25 minutes old. There's about 150 questions. Holy mm -hmm. smokes. So I'll, we'll try to maybe run through them as quickly as we can, uh, and we won't be able to get to all of them, but I'll try. So Ken asks... Oh, yeah. <laughs> that I inspired some questions. Uh, Ken asks, um, when the market is heavy, do you mean that there are more offers than bids or vice versa? And is the idea that if there are more offers than bids, that price should fall as traders try to get in front of size? Um, he, if, if so, then why does the market tend to move towards size? Uh, well, the, my, one of my bosses used to say the market always moves to the point of greatest aggravation. Uh, and when you know when the market looks heavy, uh, a lot of those offers may not actually be there. 
uh, these are you know these are people put in offers. They take out offers to, to make the market look like they want it to. We called it painting the tape uh, in back in the day. Um, it's the same thing as uh, uh, well, it, it's just hanging offers out there you don't actually have. Uh, guys that were short in the pit as the market was moving their way, they were offering 100 lots, and they may only have 10 on uh, just to try and make the market look heavy. Uh, to make the market look strong, you do the same thing. You, 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 you can place bids underneath the market to make it look like there's big interest in, um, in, uh, in, in buying in that area. Why does the market move towards those areas? Because there may be those those uh, those orders may not be there. There may there may be actually more selling going on because those orders, those bids are below. They're convincing people that the market is is firming up. You've got speculators buying against huge selling in an ice order, a growler, and then once they're once they're, that that order is done, you've got a bunch of whole new longs that are going to get a little nervous when they're not seeing price action their direction. So then you're going to see them turn around and need to get out of those trades, which is going to push the market the direction that the that the uh, that the, those bids were meant to make it look like wasn't going to happen. And sometimes by the time you get there, those bids are gone. Right. There's, uh, again, that, that uh, Nanex webinar on HFT, they went into a lot of detail uh, about how a lot of exchanges are paying for liquidity uh, and basically incentivizing um, a lot of what uh, is transpiring today with, with all these orders that disappear on a moment's notice um, mm -hmm. is basically the exact opposite of what you would expect or want. And, right. Uh, so John has a follow-up question that's very similar. He says, uh, first of all, great presentation. Uh, he says, in, you. your, in your estimation, uh, in what you've seen through your own experience, if you had to guess what percentage of iceberg and, and growler orders are actually successful in bullying the market? Hmm. Well, if they don't manage to get the whole order filled, it's, it's probably an order that they have to get filled. So they're going to end up filling the order one way or another. Uh, if the it, it's probably kind of a similar situation where you're you're you've got traders sniffing them out eventually and then and then deciding they're not going to move uh, they're not going to sell into that anymore um, you know if they've hung offers above and they're working a buyized order eventually people are going to spot them and they're going to have to move that order up it's kind of like the example in the pit where I had two thousand to buy I'd get fifteen hundred done before they'd sniff me out and then run the market up on them. Uh, Robert wants to know, I'm sorry, uh, my mouse just moved, i got to find it again. Philip wants to know if this entire concept uh, works in Forex trading, and I, I think he's probably talking about spot Forex and not uh, futures currencies, and I want to add to that, do you think that uh, it works in equities as well? You know, I'm a futures guy, I've never traded Forex, I've never traded any of that stuff, so I, I can't say for sure, but I would have to say if it's working in futures, they're going to be doing it. Up. They're going to be doing it everywhere. It's not going to just uh, be a, a futures or, or or a stock issue. It's going to be, it's going to be everything. Um, I did hear a rumor that uh, the European exchanges are talking about requiring HFTs to leave their orders in for 500 milliseconds. Yeah, that's 497 milliseconds than they do now. <laughs> yeah, Does, at least. Uh huh. So uh, I, I talked to somebody who works at an HFT company. I said, "What are you going to do?" And he said, "We're going to pull out of the European markets. Yeah. It's, it's going to that's going to kill us. It's we're going to go out of business, <laughs> right? And if they do that in the U.S., it'll be a much more level playing field. Yeah. Well, good luck. But 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 it's going to cost a lot more to trade because the HFTs aren't going to be paying all the commissions to yeah. the exchange. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let me uh, go to the next question here. Oh, there's just so many questions, guys. I apologize. I'm having to skip some of them. Uh, do you have any any comments on uh, trading options, John? Briefly, just a off the wall question. You know, um, options trading is something that I have not done for quite some time. And whenever I did trade options, it was basically if I had a uh, position in the S&Ps uh, back when I held things a little bit longer and a little bit bigger that I, that I wanted to protect. If I had a, if I had a winner on and I was convinced that you know maybe we were near a top here, I I, I might uh, you know if I was long, I, I might uh, take a look at uh, buying a uh, buying a couple of puts to kind of hedge that position if the market did turn around. 
um, or sell a couple calls if the market did turn around. Uh, but it, I never really got too in, too into any of the more complicated strategies. It was always a, a hedge for a, for a futures position when I did trade them. So I'm not really the right guy to ask about options. Did I lose you? Did I lose you? Oh, sorry. I was talking away while I was muted. <laughs> uh, okay, so yeah, we... Oh, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. It was my fault. I, I hit mute and I didn't realize. We had a really good uh, options webinar on BMT a couple weeks ago. Uh, you guys should check it out if you're an options trader. All right, Denny asks, uh, can you comment on the effective overnight inventory adjustment uh, in the attempted true direction of other time frame players that are coming in either before or just after the open? And you know, in particular, I wanted to ask you as well, what do you think about overnight trading just in general? Do you think that a lot of these these uh, principles still apply? Uh, is, it, is it happening more during cash, less during cash, or, or less overnight? What do you think? Well, I think that there's still a, a pretty decent um, uh, predatory factor at night. Um, the, the vast majority in the U.S. markets, at least in futures, uh, uh, of the risk transfer and volume is still happening in the electronic markets during the open outcry sessions. So um, I would I would think that. Uh, probably 80 or 90 percent of what your other time frame, your commercial traders are doing is happening during the open outcry session unless there's something goofy that happens and they need to execute at night. Uh, and, and I know sometimes they do. Sometimes they have a big presence. Sometimes we see some pretty big ranges at night. Um, and I know people that believe those that, that those ranges are, are easier to trade. Uh, they think that they're a lot truer. Uh, I've always had a hard time trying to get a feel for what's going on at night. Um, maybe it's just because I've been a daytime trader for so long and I'm usually sleeping. But um, you know, it, it's a it's a tough question for me to answer. I'm not really that involved at night, uh, and uh, I do think that the the real activity starts probably around five o'clock in the morning in the in the S and P's. Um, I'm usually up at 4.30, kind of watching what's going on, seeing what I can see, seeing what I can find out. Uh, occasionally, if I if I find something that really interests me, I'll put one on and and uh, protect myself and come down and see where it's at when I get to, onto the floor. Uh, but as far as you know, any kind of uh, 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 solid answer, uh, I, I I'd have to kind of look into it a little bit more right. and formulate something. So. Uh, Alex asks, uh, you know, we kind of talked about the, the small prints and we talked about iceberg orders, but what about when big prints actually come through the tape? Uh, what, what does that mean to you whenever you see a lot of big prints coming uh, in a very small uh, time frame, very small spread between them? What does that indicate okay. to you? It depends on the market, but if you're talking about the ES, uh, if it's uh, sometimes you'll, you'll have uh, a... Uh, You'll have Goldman or you'll have Smith Barney come in and they'll sell 500 bigs to the locals standing in the pit. Those locals are running right to the minis, and that 500 bigs turns into 2,500 minis, and they're all going to come through at the same time. Some of that may be some of what you're seeing, uh, as far as uh, when it's not those occasions. I would just I would imagine it's got to be. One of your other time frame players, your commercials, deciding, you know, we're, we're not going to work in ice order. We're not going to do this. We're just going to hammer it. Uh, I, you, that example I gave from a month ago on the open, uh, there must have been probably 3,500 bought right on the opening bell at 830. Boom. Two and a half handles straight up. And it sent the pit into a tizzy. You know, all these brokers that were trying to do a good job buying on the open, now they're paying up two and a half bucks. So, you know, that's just somebody hammering it instead of working stuff. Uh, Mark wants to know, do you use any type of uh, filter, like for the number of contracts on your time and sales? Um, I know they are available. Um, yeah, the and, uh, yeah I, uh, I haven't been. Um, and it, it's because um, I, I think that the, you know, the small speculator has, uh, has uh, a, a little bit of a, of an influence on 
the decisions that I'm making. I like to see one, I like to see all those one lots come across, all the all the one lots come across, especially when they pick up pace at certain levels. They they can be kind of an influence on whether I'm going to be a little stingier with a with a trade location if I'm seeing a lot of little little trades picking up, um, and uh, you know I can still see uh, your bigger trades come through. Uh, it, it does filter out a lot of the BS, a lot of the noise, right. uh, and uh, I know a lot of people that do use them. They use the thermometers. Um, right now, I, I have not been using them, and I'm probably going to start to look at them. Um, and the filters aren't a bad idea because you can kind of get faked out by some of the smaller activity that comes through. Uh, and you, really, what we're interested in is what the other, what the what the big guys are doing. So right. the filter is a, a is a good idea. I just haven't really decided to use one yet, and I'm probably going to. Uh, again, I'll briefly mention, I know that there's a lot of work on uh, BMT um, to create some indicators for NinjaTrader that attempts attempts to piece together uh, multiple orders and back into like, uh, you know, a single order uh, using timestamps and some other stuff that I don't understand. I haven't looked at it. But there's, there's lots of different ways, right, to analyze tape, whether you're filtering it either by time, uh, trying to find groups of orders, blocks of orders that have been broken apart, or if you're trying to filter out, you know, and identify big players or small players. Um, yeah. So Sergey, Sergey asks, uh, can you give us like an example of what you're looking at? Let's say that you want to be long, and you've got your level, and you want to be long. What What do you want to see? What signs do you want to see on the DOM that tell you that this is this is good to go? Okay, well, we want to put some sort of framework around this. If uh, if uh, if I'm if I want to be long and we're near the low of the range, maybe we're at the low of value or just below, uh, I'm going to be looking for just a kind of a lack of interest in trading down there. I'm going to be looking for slow, slow, uh, slow price action. Uh, I'm going to be looking for not a lot of volume uh, because that it, it's been an area of rejection before where the market did not spend a lot of time, did not stack up volume, and I'm going to be looking for uh, price action relatively soon in my direction. Uh, if the market just goes down there and lays there almost like a dead cat bounce, that's going to alert me to the fact that maybe they're not interested in moving this market back up to proceed to, to uh, earlier balance. Perhaps there are some sellers laying in the weeds here looking for people to come in and buy this thing and then they're going to then they're going to take it lower. So uh, it's going to be a combination of the activity that I'm seeing um, you know, and if, if and if the market is just kind of laying there, you're not really going to get an indication of uh, uh, from what side the market is trading on. Uh, it's probably going to be trading a little bit on both sides. Price action is going to be slow, uh, so I'm going to probably look at taking that long position, and then I'm going to watch if uh, if the market doesn't, if buyers don't come back in and buy it cheap where they thought where they thought it was cheap before. Right. right. Within a reasonable amount of time, I'm going to think, okay, you know, that these buyers are no longer here, and we may be looking for those buyers at a lower level pretty soon. So that's one of the things that I'm going to be looking for. Right. So to put it like in auction market theory terms, you're basically looking for acceptance or rejection, uh, you know, at a level. Hey, absolutely. Uh, uh, here's a question. I can't pronounce his name. I apologize. How exactly are you journaling? Is it uh, pen and paper? Is it Excel? Or using you know, what are you, some software? What are you doing? You know, I uh, I uh, was um, I remember a day without cell phones and computers. I write. Uh, I have uh, I've I've made myself a kind of a template for uh, for the day uh, for for each trade. Um, each trade kind of goes on its uh, in its own little square on these pieces of paper, and then I have. Uh, an assessment, you know, a time of day, uh, a mental assessment, an assessment of um, uh, a kind of a checklist. Of, am I seeing activity? Am I seeing? Uh, am I getting correlating signals from two separate tools, uh, Market Profile, and um, uh, I, I've been looking at uh, uh, a, a trade chart or a tick chart with the ADX. Um, that's one of the tools that I've been looking at. I try not to get. Too many tools going, uh, but mostly it's market profile and, and activity. Uh, and then I go through the checklist. Okay, mental checklist, market state, activity, um, uh, trade location. If those are all good, I take the trade. Um, uh, and then I, I will make notes. Uh, I have little symbols that I put for uh, whether I'm anxious in the trade, whether I'm relaxed in the trade. Uh, and then I, you know, I, I, I have an outcome line where I state the outcome of the trade. And then uh, I've added a line for 
uh, what I was seeing in, in the dome and in time and sales, if I was seeing uh, what I thought was uh, legitimizing or verifying my trade, if I'm if I'm if I'm seeing if I'm thinking I'm seeing uh, things that are not verifying my trade, if I'm looking for an increase in activity and it doesn't happen, and then how I'm dealing with it, how I'm how, how did I react to that information? Did I do the right thing? Did I do the wrong thing? Could I have done something better? Right. And and more about you know what could I have done better? Not just could I have, what could I have done better? What did I miss? What do I need to recognize next time? Right. I mean, it's obviously you're only going to get out as much as you put in, but I find a lot of people uh, spend time, uh, you know, writing posts for the journal, but then I never see them, you know, going back and analyzing it. You know, I, I say like at the end of every week, you know, on the weekend, go back and read the last two weeks of posts and try to make sure that you're moving forward, you're not going in a circle, you're making some kind of progress, you know, look for patterns and things. I mean, obviously, you know, you're spending time to, to record this stuff in a journal. You need to spend more time analyzing it so you can find these patterns of your behavior or, or Oh, yeah. Whatever. If you, if you yeah. don't, if you'll never look at it again, you know, you've, <laughs> right. done, you've done one step. Right. But that's the first thing I look at in the morning before I sit down. I mean, I go through those trades. I kind of close my eyes, relive them a little bit, think about what I could have done better, what I need right. to do better, what I, you know, how I can see things better, and uh, it really does right. speed up the learning curve on anything that you're trying to do. Absolutely. And, you know, a lot of people just kind of think of a journal as like an Excel spreadsheet to record entries and exits, and it's just, that's, you know, your trading platform can spit that out. You know, it's much more than that. you gotta, you got to yeah. put more into it so that you can find patterns of your own behavior, or, you know, why you're doing something why you thought the market was a good value here, or why you took a short, or why you exited early, whatever. Look for patterns in your own behavior. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, a, I'm a musician from way back. You'll learn more spending 15 minutes a day, every day, with your guitar than you will spending 10 hours in one day. Uh, RJ asks, do you use any type of uh, market internals or breadth like tick or prim or anything like that? Uh, I do see them. Um, I, do I do I make quick judgments on them? No. Uh, the tick, the trend, the ticky, all that stuff is right. It's right above my head, and uh, I do know people that that look at them. And but I've never been able to find any rhyme or reason for how they're going to help me indicate when it, when when's a good time. You know that they, they they may tell you, okay, things are really bearish right now, or things are really bullish right now, but. They, what what am I what am I going to do with that information? I've never really figured out how I'm going to in the time frame that I'm that I'm trading. Now, if I have a trade on and I'm short and the, and the, the the trend keeps going up and the, the tick and the ticky keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger, well, that kind of verifies what I'm thinking. Uh, but as far as initiating trades, not really. It may it may kind of help me pick a side not to trade from. Uh, but as far as uh, as locations and stuff like that, not really. Okay, uh, Nigel wants to know: Do you have any any thoughts on uh, trading correlated or uncorrelated markets, and w which which markets do you prefer to trade? Do you do you prefer to trade correlated or uncorrelated? Um, well, I prefer to trade one. <laughs> uh, I'm not. I'm, I don't try and spread myself too thin. Uh, will I look at, at correlated and inverse correlated markets for verification and uh, exit points? Yeah, from time to time in trading the ES. If I'm short and I and uh, and uh, I notice the the ten years or the thirty year uh, seem to have topped off and maybe even start to take a little bit of trade direction. The other way, I, I might I might think about okay, you know what this this looks like this may lend a little support to the S and P's. If I have multiples on, I'm going to lighten up at that point and uh, and then perhaps even cover the whole position and start over. You know, if it's a if I'm if I'm short and it's a winner and I, and I'm getting some, some inverse correlation telling me that this could be a bottom, then you know I'm at least going to lighten up, if not cover the whole thing. I can always take another trade. There's another one coming down the pipe. Um, and then you know there, these. I'm of course watching the Nasdaq, watching the Dow, uh, the Nasdaq. You know, with the whole Google rumor, uh, the whole Google thing today is what is what took the S and P's down. Uh, what I'm sure had a profound effect on the Dow. I don't think I was watching it quite at that point, but uh, you know, you've got to be watching the, the, what's going on around you because quite often the, the 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 signal for you to take action in getting into a position or out of a position is going to come from another market. Uh, do I watch them, you know, uh, intently, uh, religiously? Not necessarily. 
uh, but I do have them up as far as charts on my on my uh, platform. And uh, if I do notice a disconnect or uh, an inverse correlated or an inverse correlation, giving me a signal that this might be it, I'm gonna I'm probably gonna react to it in some way, if not wholly. Right. Uh, I see a lot of questions about whether or not the webinar is recorded, so I want to remind everybody that all the webinars that we do are always recorded, and I will post it on BMT in the usual spot tomorrow. That's BigMikeTrading.com. Click on webinars; it'll be there tomorrow, and I will be sending it to Top Step Trader, and they they will also uh, you know send it out on their Twitter and and post it. Okay, uh, next question. Jim wants to know, uh, John, can you can you briefly review your your workflow for identifying a point of interest, you know, what are you using to identify a, an area of interest or a point of interest? What tools are you using? Um, absolutely. Um, on the floor, uh, we have a CQG machine that will line up all the profiles day next to day in price order. Uh, I'll go. I go back in time, and I notice a, uh, I'll find areas that were rejected in in recent history and accepted in recent history. Those are going to be levels that I'm going to be keeping an eye out for, in a more historical sense. Uh, and and certainly, if the market is not trading anywhere near the previous day's range, uh, I will be initially looking for where the market opens up in relation to the previous day's range. If there's energy in the market, if the market opens outside the previous day's range, or uh, at the high of the previous day's range, or below, that's it. That's information for me. Uh, I'm going to be using the highs and lows of that range, and and probably the. Um, value areas of that range for reference if we do start to enter into that day's range. If we open within the, day, the day's range, um, I'm going to be looking at the, the high and low value as support and resistance initially. Um, if they don't hold, then I'm going to be looking to my levels from further back, those areas of rejection and acceptance that I've, that I, that I've collected from, uh, you know, probably the past three weeks uh, in profile history or even perhaps further back than that if we've moved away from from where the market has been there so I'm always looking at where history has shown that the market has rejected levels and accepted levels those are the, my areas of interest above and below where we're currently trading but I'm always looking at the current days um, value area the, the current date type uh, I like to I like to keep track of the average daily range um, because I think it's a good indication of when there's a more or less energy being exhibited in the market. Uh, when you have a market that's trending and you've got several uh, profiles that are lining up as as like a trend, you know, higher highs, higher lows, higher highs, higher lows. Um, when it starts to peter out, you'll get a day that uh, that gets instead of a long thin um, uh, profile, you might end up with a kind of a a, 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 a day that doesn't have as big a range, uh, spends more time in the middle, uh, and you end up with a kind of a fatter profile uh, that kind of indicates to me that the energy is kind of running out in that direction. I'm going to be in a longer time frame. I'm watching volume and open interest. If if open interest is falling off in that direction, that's my first signal. Okay, there's a there's a market state change coming, and I better be ready for it. Um, but as far as you know, from day to day, I'm looking at, at areas that uh, the market has recently accepted or rejected, as recently as I can get, and then I'm watching to see how the market reacts to those. Uh, what were my? All right. So there's there's basically uh, a whole lot of market profile questions, which I'm going to skip and save that for a future webinar. <laughs> And then there's, okay. I'm going to say there's probably two questions left, and then we'll wrap things up. So one of them is, uh, John, do you think that uh, uh, this guy says, is it true that 99% of locals are flat before the end of the day? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And second question I wanted to ask you briefly, do you, do you think that, um, okay, obviously, you know, we have range-bound days, we have consolidation, and we have trends. Do you tend to enter whenever the market is highly compressed and, and very consolidated or in a tight range is that uh, is that a good place to enter or do you look to enter um, I think I already know the answer to this do you look to enter uh, after there's a there's a move away from that compression or that tight range and 
do you prefer to, are you a mean reversion guy, are you a counter trend trader, or do you prefer to trade with the trend? Well, I, I don't like to trade against the trend. Uh, if there is a trend, I'm going to be trying to um, uh, notice the areas of, of balance, even if they're short-term balances, and I'm going to be trying to, uh, in a trending market, buy near the low of those little balances uh, if, it, if it's going to continue. Um, I love the range bound days, uh, and the bigger the range, uh, the better. Um, in the range bound days, you know the, those four and f or five or six handle range days will drive you crazy. Uh, but if I can get a decent range in a range bound day, I love those days. Um, and if I can catch a breakout and 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 manage to get into something that continues in that direction for a while, I love those days too. If a, if, a, if a trend is already established, I have a hard time getting into those. I'm working on a technique to help me do that. Um, and that's a story for another day. But uh, extreme volatility, I stay away from. I don't even get involved. Uh, I've I found that um, it's, it's, for me, at this stage, it's not, it's not worth the risk. Um, you know, when you get really urgent days, really urgent trades, I may take a shot at one of them, um, and those are days you know that uh, that you 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 can't afford to wait for the market to come back for you. Those are the days you've just got to kind of hang on and and push the button. But um, you know, if you're wrong about that, you end up buying a high or selling a low, and you end up getting chased out. So uh, I I go for my high percentage, and I'm, I'm not a good volatility you know wild day trader. I know this. Right. Uh, those days for me are over, so I avoid those days. Right. Well, I'm like you, and I, I look a lot uh, at profile to help me, you know, determine those types of things and to help me, you know, sell the top of value or buy the bottom of value, looking for a reversion back into value with a very small stop if I'm wrong. Um, so I, I like profile. I encourage people to check out profile because I think it's a really uh, useful way to uh, analyze the market. And, John, I will uh, ask you to come back at some point and do a profile webinar. So uh, I would enjoy that, and uh, we'll see if we can't come up with uh, some really great ideas for, right. for people to look at. All right, guys, so uh, we're coming up on, what, like an hour and a half or so in this webinar, so I think this is a good point to, uh, to go ahead and stop. Plus, John is sick, and I don't want to keep him on here longer <laughs> than we need to. So, uh, the, the, again, the webinar has been recorded. I will post it on BMT sometime tomorrow. Uh, for all you guys that came from Top Step Trader, uh, you just go to bigmytrading.com and click on webinars at the top of the page sometime tomorrow and it'll be there. Um, so thanks again, John, for all of your time and the presentation today and for answering everybody's questions. And, Thank uh, you, Mike. I really appreciate it. And uh, uh, trade well, everybody. Yep. Thanks, guys. Thanks, John. Thank you.